This is Success Stories, a program of the Sorrell College of Business that highlights the lives and careers of people who have accomplished great things. I'm your host, Alan Mendenhall, Associate Dean of the Sorrell College Business and Executive Director of the Manuel H. Johnson Center for Political Economy. My guest today is Professor John Eastman. John, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Professor. Until recently, John, your career was widely considered a success. You held an endowed chair at Chapman University uh, Fowler School of Law with a strong record of scholarship. You are an effective dean of that school. You are the founding director of the Center for Constitutional Jurisprudence at the Claremont Institute. You hold a doctorate in government from Claremont Graduate School and a law degree from the University of Chicago. You clerked on the Fourth Circuit and for the United States Supreme Court. You are an attorney with Kirkland and Ellis and a regular contributor to national media, both in print and on television. You ran for Attorney General of California. You ran for Congress. What has happened over the last few years? Well, I was re received a call from President Trump to represent him in the Supreme Court of the United States in some of the election challenges. And of course, uh, uh, what is the old line from the movie? Uh, something happened on the way to the forum, funny thing. Uh, uh, you know, the, I, I got caught up and became a central figure in the challenges to highlight the illegality that occurred in the 2020 election. And that uh, confronts a, a narrative that is put out by people in control of this government that they don't want to hear. And so it's been quite a roller coaster ride ever since. The controversy centers on <clears throat> advice that you gave to the president regarding the power or authority of Mike Pence to unilaterally reject certified state electors. And do you still believe that President, Vice President Pence had that authority? Well, I never gave that, uh, that advice. Uh, other people had talked about his authority simply to reject. I was always of the position that because the alternate slate of electors that had voted for President Trump had never been certified by any court or any legislature, that what he should do is accede to requests from state legislators to give them a little bit more time, now that they were back in a session, to assess what everybody acknowledged was illegal conduct of the election and trying to determine whether that had an impact. Um, that was the advice I had given to the president and, uh, and also uh, petitioned the vice president to take seriously that point, to try and put things to rest, to actually get an investigation that we weren't getting anywhere else. And I still believe, so the, the, the language of the 12th Amendment on which this advice was based is ambiguous. The vice president clearly opens the certificates in the presence of the House and Senate, and then they shall be counted. It shifts to the passive voice. And so and throughout our history, we've never settled who actually does the counting. But most of the scholarship implicit in his authority to open and implicit in his uh, authority to count is the ability to, to make judgments about the validity of those electoral votes. And we, what we were asking is he send it back to the state legislatures who have clear authority to direct the manner of choosing electors to determine what to do about the illegality. So what would have happened if that process had played out, mm -hmm. if, if uh, the vice president had acted differently? Because the inauguration was what, January 20th or something like that? What, what would have happened in that period well, I think, I think the letter that came in from the President Pro Tem of the Pennsylvania Senate is most, uh, most enlightening. He laid out, on behalf of a majority of the state Senate, his letter said, uh, the illegality that had occurred uh, and specifically said our election should not have been certified. And what they wanted to do was try and assess the impact of that. Now, we're still three years later trying to figure out exactly what happened. So they could not conclusively uh, address, investigate all the allegations of fraud. But they ma could make some extrapolations on things we did know and make a an assessment uh, based on the best evidence they had on whether the Vice President uh, Biden had actually won the election or whether, in fact, Trump had won the election. And they could make that assessment based on the knowledge we had. And that's what we were asking. And they, they were asking for a week to 10 days, and that was all, to be able to make that assessment. They tried to do it a month earlier. They tried to come into special session. Their governors refused to call them into special session. And so now that week they were coming into normal session, and they're going to take this up and do it very expeditiously. Do you regret anything about that period? Any uh, anything that happened during that period let's say let's say for example just january 6 speaking before the crowds on january 6 do you wish you had just played the role as lawyer and and done the legal advisement and then not spoken on january 6 well we got a call from the the rally organizers and there were about a half a million people there and it was cold 
And uh, I love Lee Greenwood, but you can only listen to him so many times in the <laughs> same hour. Uh, and they said, the president's been delayed in coming over. And they asked Rudy and me to come over and just say a few words. Uh, I didn't think anything of it at the time. The notion that what, in, in my three minute extemporaneous comments, that I incited the riot that went on down two miles d later down the, uh, down the street on Pennsylvania Avenue, uh, it's just nonsense. That meant half a million people were so incited to imin imminently go down to the Capitol and what, not listen to the president in the United States that they'd come in from all over the country to hear? I mean, it was laughable. Um, I thought, though, that it was extremely important that people know what we were basing our assessment on. Illegality in the conduct of the election is the first thing that I talked about. Um, traditional fraud, dead people voted. Uh, I've been accused in the California bar of falsely stating dead people voted, and in the same paragraph, the bar uh, lawyers that filed the complaint against me said, as, as he knew, the Inspector General of Michigan confirmed only 1,500 dead people voted. Well, that meant what I said was true. So I thought it was extremely important to that crowd of a half million and all Americans around the country that we actually look at what went on in that election. Because at bottom, our country is based on the consent of the governed. That is one of our foundational cornerstone principles. Uh, and if, and we, do, we exercise that consent through free and fair elections. If the elections aren't fair, if they're not free, then we're no longer in control of our government. People have said, well, you know, keep continuing to talk about the, the illegality in the election, you're undermining democracy. And I immediately respond. I said, it's not undermining democracy to highlight illegality in the election. It's the people that are conducting the illegality that are undermining our election. And I think we have to air that. It remains a scab on our body politic and every, uh, that, that needs to be addressed if we're ever going to heal. And it has not been addressed. And my mission is to make sure that people address it. What's the basis of the uh, grievance filed against you in the California State Bar? So laughably, they said I didn't honor my oath to uphold the Constitution, which in fact, that's everything I did. And if you look at my memo uh, laying out the different scenarios, which was just an internal um, brainstorming document, by the way, but, but on, the, on the scenario that was actually the advice I gave, it was to send it back to the state legislatures to assess the impact of the illegality. And then the memo quite specifically says, uh, if, in fact, they determine that Biden won or that um, we cannot determine who actually won and they recertify Biden, and then big, bold letters, Biden wins. That's in my memo. Um, but if, in fact, they can determine uh, beyond reasonable doubt or at least by a preponderance of the evidence that, in fact, Trump won, then in order to give effect to the will of the voters, then he ought to be certified to be the candidate that was, was elected by the people. Um, and, uh, so uh, they claim I undermine the Constitution by insisting that we follow the Constitution. It's a, it's a rather bizarre argument. Well, and do you think it broadens the scope of potential grievances filed against other attorneys if you are in good faith giving legal advice regarding a constitutional matter and then somebody files a bar complaint on the basis of what you in good faith believe to be sound legal advice. Yeah, it's, it's a danger, and we don't have to speculate that that's what their goal is. The head of the 65 Project, who's one of the organizations bringing these bar complaints against lawyers all over the country, has specifically said our goal is not just to have them disbarred, but to make them so toxic in their firms and their communities that right-wing legal talent will never take on these kind of election challenges again. I mean, think about what that means. Um, our adversarial system of justice ensures that we have the ability to raise illegality and, and, and press the issues forward. If you prevent one side of any dispute from weighing in in the courts of law, you no longer have an adversarial system of justice and you will have cleared the path for future election illegality and fraud without anybody daring to challenge it. What about this notion of a peaceful transition of power? I'm sure you've heard many times people accusing you of at a minimum, maybe you didn't do anything illegal, you didn't do anything wrong, but um, people might say, well, there was still, there's still a tradition of the peaceful transition of power that goes back to George Washington and that there are um, precedents that ought to have been followed in that regard. Well, 
There's no question there should be a peaceful transition of power, and I was vo quite vocal against those that engaged in violence uh, in a riot that got out of control, a protest that got out of control and became a bit of a riot on January 6th. Um, but that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about here is challenging illegality that may have prevented the actual winner from the election from being, uh, from getting transitioned to himself for a second term. Um, peaceful transition of power implies that the election was fair and that the person that we're transitioning power to actually won the election. That's what remains in dispute. It's not a peaceful transition of power. It's not a transition, a valid transition of power, if in fact the guy that's being installed did not win the election. And if we're going to continue to insist on consent of the governed, we have to get an answer to whether in fact we put in office the right guy who had actually won the election. Well, and you've been fairly vocal. You've done interviews, you've done national interviews. Typically, in uh, criminal cases, the client is advised not really to speak, not to give interviews, not to say, but you are a law professor uh, and um, know your case very well, and you've been very vocal. What, what, has, um, what has motivated you to do that? What is, what is the strategy behind that? So, yeah, my, my defense lawyers, and I've got lawyers working in Georgia, in New Mexico, in California, in New York, in Washington, D.C., in Boston. I mean, we got a, quite a team. It's uh, very expensive. In fact, uh, if anybody on your audience would like to help with that legal defense, I think, I think the, uh, uh, the, 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 the video is going to have that, the link to my, my legal defense fund site. But they immediately told me that what the standard line is, you know, be quiet, don't say anything. Uh, and I quickly realized that this fight had very little to do with the law. The law is being distorted and stretched in a way to get Trump and anybody near him. That this was a political battle. And for us not to be talking in the political arena, on media, publishing, whatever, would be to cede the main battlefield in this war. And so I, not only did I determine that I should be doing that, but my lawyers all came to the same conclusion relatively quickly that that needed to be done. And so I've been out there, which of course puts a bigger target on my back because with my credentials, my experience, my 200 over cases that I've been involved with in the Supreme Court, my former deanship, my Supreme Court clerkship with Justice Clarence Thomas, um, I'm a guy that has a lot of credibility saying these kind of things and it's not so easy to write it off and so they have to destroy me and that's what they're trying to do and that's why I'm calling on people to help me stay in the fight because this the LA Times wanted to do a human event story on me and my family over Christmas talking about how depressed we were and how devastated we've been by all this and they asked me that question I said I don't know what you're talking about our country's on a precipice about whether we're going to continue to be a country with freedom or not. And for whatever reason, I've been cast into a leading role in that fight. It's one of the greatest honors of my life to be able to engage in that fight and to be, have the experience and the credentials and the, the skills to be able to engage in that fight. Because this is the fight for our time. It's comparable to the fight that our founders had against the tyrannical government in 1776. Uh, th these are the kind of things that people um, s rise to the occasion uh, and, and embrace to fight for freedom, and that's what we're doing. Have you lost friends over the <clears throat> last couple of years? I, I've lost friends of people, of the, the never Trump, Trump crowd in particular. I, it's like a disease they can't see straight. Uh, but I've gained, uh, I, I think I've got almost 10,000 donors to my legal defense fund, people I've never met. That's little old ladies on Social Security that send in a $5 check and write, I wish I could send you more, but I'm on a fixed income. Or people just out of the blue send me $10,000 to help with the legal defense because I'm standing for exposing the truth of what happened in 2020 so that we can make sure it doesn't happen again. We, if we lose the ability to have free elections, um, we lose our ability to control our government. We no longer are citizens. We become subjects of an oppressive government. That's a fight worth having. And o overwhelmingly, people are waking up to that fight and supporting those that are on the front lines. Hillary Clinton said of the 2016 election, which of course she lost, that there's a lot that I think will be revealed. History will discover you don't win by three million votes and have all this other shenanigans and stuff going on and not come away with an idea like, whoa, something's not right there. She suggested that Russia interfered in the election. 
We know that Russia did interfere with the election, but we don't know whether that in interference was outcome determinative. We don't know the extent of it. Um, Stacey Abrams, who lost the Georgia gubernatorial election to Brian Kemp in 2018, alleged the election was, quote, stolen, quote, rigged, quote, not free or fair. Why did the media and legal profession, including government attorneys, treat these claims differently from yours or President Trump's? Well, I think the difference is our claims were true and theirs were false, <laughs> which means that they ought to be the ones investigated, not me, if we're going to have a fair, equal justice before the law system. Um, but it's also highly partisan. Look, the Department of Justice, the upper echelons of the Department of Justice are highly partisan. Um, we know, for example, on Hillary's false claims of Russia collusion, uh, w which claims were produced with funding that she laundered through her law firm and the DNC, the Democrat National Committee, laundered through her law firm uh, to create this false narrative. We know that was false. We know that officials in the Department of Justice and the FBI doctored evidence to get a FISA warrant, Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act warrant, on their opposing political campaign uh, and spy on him during the campaign, continue to spy on him after he was elected, and continue to spy on him even after he was inaugurated. This is the greatest political scandal in our nation's history, and yet because of the partisan politics of those involved in supposedly investigating it, it has been shuffled under the rug. Is it frightening to face criminal charges? Are, do you feel afraid? Do you lie awake at night and worry about prison or what may happen in the future? Well, I, I long, long uh, since came to peace with the, the deck of cards I've been dealt, <laughs> the hand I've been dealt. Um, I'm fairly convinced that if the truth prevails, uh, if we have an honest jury in Georgia, uh, that, uh, that no conviction will end because, the, quite frankly, the charges are frivolous and ought to be brought <laughs> after a couple of people entered pleas to avoid the millions of dollars in legal fees that it would take. Um, I got a request from a reporter whether I would consider such a plea, and I said, yeah, I'd consider a plea. Here would be the terms. They drop all charges against me because they're frivolous, and I won't file a pro malicious prosecution suit against them. And then I also offered to testify truthfully, either for the state or any of the defendants, because I would say the truth, and it would uh, vindicate everything that was done in the course of that election. Um, so if we have a fair justice system, uh, I, I, I don't worry about it. If we don't have a fair justice system, uh, the things to worry about are much bigger than what happens to me. Well, let's go back and talk about something else. Not, not many people are asking you about your period as a dean of a law school and how that went and uh, the fundraising prowess that you uh, demonstrated as a dean and, and how much that law school grew during your tenure. So we were uh, a relatively new law school uh, when I became dean in 2007. We'd only been in existence for a decade. Uh, we were struggling in the bottom tier of accredited law schools in the country. And uh, a new law school was about to open down the road from us at the University of California, Irvine. And because it was University of California, it would immediately make a big splash. And we determined that if I didn't get us out of the uh, bottom tier and maybe into the top 100 before they opened, we may just be st stagnated into that lower ranking. So we were 168th when I took uh, the deanship, and uh, law, law deans claw to pick up three or four slots in the rankings in any given year. In my three years as dean, we went from 168 to 93rd, made it into the top 100 before I stepped down. That was extraordinary. Um, we also, we also, one of the one of the deans of one of the other Southern law schools, Southern California law schools, called me and congratulated me on my first hire, a Nobel Prize winner, Vernon Smith. We'd hired away from George Mason, and he said, "You have no idea how difficult I've, you've just made my life." I said, "What are you talking about? You're one of the top 20 law schools in the country." He said, "Yeah, but every dean's meeting, our president of the university asks us how many Nobel laureates we've been soliciting, and I finally last month." convinced him there were no Nobel Prizes in law, so it's not possible to get anybody on a law faculty. And then you hire Vernon Smith, a Nobel laureate in economics, on your law faculty. It's made my life very difficult, he said. Now, it was quite a successful run. Well, Vernon Smith is an amazing man. He's still kicking. I see on Facebook and other uh, sort of fora that he is out there giving speeches, traveling the country, and he's 90-something. He's, and I think he's late 90s. He, Ener Energizer Bunny, both he and his wife. And they're delightful people, and I was just honored to be able to bring them up to Chapman. Well, let's go forward to the, the next election. Just predict what, what will happen in 
the election that will take place? So what do you in, in the um, upcoming election, um, the kind of what I call retail fraud, um, p people voting from vacant lots, dead people uh, casting votes, and, uh, you know, I said, dead people don't vote. I said, well, yeah, I'm, I'm not claiming that they are ghouls and they show up to vote. Obviously, somebody else is casting a ballot for them. But there are so many eyes on election operations uh, right now because in every county, in every state in the country, people are watching. They're vetting the roles. When they see 28 people registered at an efficiency apartment that can only accommodate two people, and, they're, and, they, and they go knock on the door, and none of the 28 people have ever lived there before. Um, they're watching that, and they're getting that cleaned up. So that kind of fraud will be minimized. Uh, what I'm more nervous about is the, um, the uh, sophisticated technological frauds. We've seen, we've got three different audits uh, of machine equipment that demonstrate uh, massive problems with with source code. Would these be by foreign governments, or would these there's, be there's, by domestic? I, I, I've not been able to trace it, so I don't want to speculate. It'll get me in trouble. But but uh, the ability to hack into these systems, whether by malevolent back, uh, actors here or abroad, has been clearly demonstrated by experts in the field on both sides of the political aisle. Uh, there's a case pending down in Georgia called Curling versus Raffensperger, where some of the leading experts in the world on this stuff have been testifying. This scares me because the system is a black box. We don't have the ability to look at it while things are happening. And, and uh, the system seems in the code uh, designed to allow people to go in and make vote changes and then delete the log entries where that happened. The log is not a true log. It's a, it's a text code that can be altered and then back out and then re-encrypt and nobody can confirm it uh, after the fact. This is what scares me. And until our government uh, uh, investigative bodies actually get to the bottom of that, I don't think we can be confident in, in the, the validity of elections. I, I, hope, I hope we get that fixed in the next six months. Because if we have another election scandal in 2024 like he had in, like we had in 2020, and God help us, because uh, I think people have about had it uh, with being fed lines of bull uh, that they know are lines of bull. Do you think if President Trump were reelected that he would grant you a pardon? Well, the biggest threat to me right now is in Georgia, which is a state proceeding. The president doesn't have any authority for that. Neither does the governor of Georgia. There's a, a special pardon committee. But I don't think we're ever going to get to that. Um, uh, the federal charges against President Trump in D.C., um, I think will eventually get thrown out on a couple of grounds. One, the special prosecutor has no lawful authority to have been appointed. I think that's quite clear. Former Attorney General Ed Meese weighed in with a brief uh, along with uh, Steve Calabresi on that score. I think they're right about that. Uh, he was not president appointed, Senate confirmed, and he was not even in a position where president appointment, Senate confirmed, and yet he's uh, exercising this awesome prosecutorial authority President's immunity claims, I think, are, are very strong. But also, and the Supreme Court has taken this issue up in one of the um, J6 Sixer cases, uh, this creative, expandive interpretation of the obstruction of an official proceeding statute that they're using against the J6 defendants. And one of the key charges against President Trump in the indictment that Jack Smith brought against him, that's an old mob witness intimidation statute. It was expanded to prevent, and after Enron, to prevent uh, companies from destroying documents that would that were about to be on which they were about to be prosecuted. They have distorted that statute out of recognition to apply to a peaceful protest that got out of control in Congress as if there was some ob obstruction of official proceeding in the way that that statute covers. And I'm fairly confident the Supreme Court's going to say, you can't distort these statutes beyond their recognition in order to go after your political opponents. Are you still working with the Claremont Institute? I am. I'm a senior fellow at the Claremont Institute, and I continue to be the founding director of its Center for Constitutional Jurisprudence. Um, that's on, in that capacity, we support We've got lots of litigation going on right now that we support. Um, one of my favorites uh, on the question of courage and standing up against tyrannical government is by a young man named uh, Jaden Rodriguez. Uh, you may not know his name, but I'll bet you know his story because it went viral. Uh, Jaden's the 12-year-old in Colorado Springs 
who had a Gadsden flag patch on his backpack. And uh, the teacher told him it had to, or the vice principal told him it had to be removed um, because it was a symbol of slavery. And he quite rightly pointed out to them, no, it was a symbol of um, defending against freedom, against government tyranny. Well, he was suspended from school for having that patch. And, and they reached out to me and we're representing him. And this is a 12-year-old who has more courage than most of the people I deal with on a daily basis. And, it's, and it gives me encouragement that people in the next generation seem to understand what's going on and they are educating themselves to be able to deal with it. This is a generation that I'm going to be happy to pass the baton to if they continue in the mold of, of Jada and Rodriguez. Well, I've noticed that the Claremont Institute has grown bolder over the last few years. I think when I noticed sort of a market change was around 2016 when National Review uh, ran sort of a, a, an anti-Trump uh, issue devoted specifically to that, and many of the Claremont people stuck, st stood up for, for, for Donald Trump. And that, to me, marked a shift, and, and, and at least to me as an, as an external out, outside observer, and uh, sort of the Clare Claremont Institute's positioning. Is that a fair well, read? It's not so much a shift in their positioning, but it, there was a circumstances that required them to weigh in. You know, I mean, remember, um, the full name of the Claremont Institute is the Claremont, Claremont Institute for the Study of Statesmanship and Political Philosophy. And in calm times, we get to focus more on the political philosophy. But in contentious times, one has to focus more on the statesmanship side of that. Our heroes at the Institute are Winston Churchill and Abraham Lincoln, as well as the, the American founding generation. Um, and so the question is, w were we confronted with such a time? And was Donald Trump such a person? Now, <laughs> people are going to say, you're comparing him to Lincoln and Churchill. No, I'm not. Um, but what, what the situation that we were confronted with and the, the deep state mentality of Washington this, what I've called an authoritarian move or an Orwellian move. We're the government, we've spoken, you just have to bend the knee and listen. Whether it's CRT or transgender in our, in our girls' showers um, or, or uh, the election. Uh, Trump was willing to fight back like a punch-drunk boxer. <laughs> uh, and that's what we determined was necessary for the moment. Well, John, thank you for joining us in uh, these contentious times. Thank you very much, Alan. This has been Success Stories. I'm your host, Alan Mendenhall. Until next time.